Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice. Let's be glad in it. Welcome to your Father's house. Pray with me, please. Almighty God, we thank you for this Sunday, the first day of the new year. We thank you, God, for putting it on our hearts to spend New Year's Day in your house. And we pray, God, that throughout this day, the words of that old hymn that Cindy just played will echo in our ears. Let there be peace on earth, and let it begin with me. Lord, in each of our lives, there's someone that we're not at peace with. And it may also very well be that we sense that we're not at peace with you. Through your Son, would you bring that peace to our lives. In Christ's holy name, amen. Do me a favor and sign this little yellow attendance card that you'll find in the pew rack in front of you. Wednesday night dinners resume this week, so uh, sign up for Wednesday night dinners on that card. If you have special prayer requests, these get right back to me, so please let me know about that. If you'll look at the half sheet in the bulletin, along with uh, Wednesday night meal, uh, all the activities for every age begin again this Wednesday. And then our PDO uh, pre-K resumes this week as well. Look on the back of the bulletin. You'll see we have a new Bible verse for this year. It's 1 Chronicles 16, verse 11. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. And if you've not yet collected one of the uh, baby bottles, I thought I had one up here. Yep. Uh, please get one of these baby bottles and uh, fill it up with change or bills or put a check in there as we help support uh, life choices. And then you'll remember on the first Sunday of the month when we have the Lord's Supper, uh, in uh, old Scottish Presbyterian tradition, we collect an offering for the poor and the needy, and that envelope is in the pew rack also. One of our elders, Cheryl Dunstan, is going to come up and hit the high notes on the elders notes. Good morning. about it on Christmas Day, so that's why we're having, I'm giving you the, the notes today. First, I would like to um, thank uh, Carol Hendren for ordering the defibrillator and Barbara and Dennis Glaze for hanging it, and to Lisa Hart and all of her committee that decorated the church for uh, Christmas and then undecorated it yesterday. We had a few people here to do that. Um, we had a, a nice gift from uh, Brad Whitaker in memory of his parents, Jimmy and Jean Whitaker, uh, we, the elders decided to tie the $1,000 to a local needy family, so we wanted to tell you about that. Um, also, if you all have not turned in your pledge cards, please do that because we want to keep this ch uh, church growing and prosperous and continue to pray for our minister. Thank you. Good morning. Please stand so we can worship our Lord through music.
our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. Praise be to the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in singing, We Believe. Please be seated. Would uh, our deacons Janice Linder and Karen Huddleston please come stand on this side of the Lord's table and then elders Lynn Fryman, Tracy Gatlin and Dennis Glaze. Would you please come stand on this side of the Lord's table. It really does matter what you believe and officers in the Presbyterian Church must believe certain things, and so I'm going to be delineating some of these things and these questions that I'll ask them from the Book of Order. 
All of these candidates, including our newest elder, Dennis Glaze, have been ordained before. Um, Linda Malier is uh, taking chemotherapy, and so she's not able to be here today. But Linda has also been ordained before. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, do you? Do you believe the Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God, totally trustworthy, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, the supreme, final, and only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures, do you? Do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with the system of doctrine as taught in the Scriptures and as contained in the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? Do you promise? Do you affirm and adopt the essentials of our faith without exception, do you? Do you subscribe to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? Do you promise subjection to your fellow elders in the Lord? Have you been induced, as far as you know your own heart, to seek the office of ruling elder or deacon from your love of God and a sincere desire to promote His glory in the gospel of His Son? Have you? Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the pur purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise to you on that account? Do you promise? Will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as a ruling elder or deacon, whether personal or interpersonal, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before the congregation of which God is now making you an elder or a deacon. And then finally, are you now willing to accept the call of this church as ruling elders and deacons and relying upon God for strength, promise to discharge the duties required of that office? Do you promise? And then I'd like the members of the congregation to please stand. Are you the members of Highland Heights Presbyterian Church ready to receive these believers as elders and deacons? Are you? Do you promise to submit to them in manners of spiritual discipline and to receive with humility and love the word of truth? Do you promise to support them with your prayers, to give encouragement and assistance in every way, as they seek to instruct you in the things of the Lord and lead you in the building of the kingdom of God in this place. And then finally, do you commit yourselves to fulfill the call that you have given them that the name of Christ might be glorified? All right, remain standing and let me pray. Oh God, thank you for the old language that we still use. We talk about elders and deacons and communion and baptism and faith. But help us also to be in tune with technology, with all the ways that you're using to bring people to saving faith in Christ. May these elders and these deacons have at the top of their list of things to do in this new year to first of all themselves be drawn closer to you that they would be in church every time the doors are open unless they're sick, and that they would want others to know your Son as their Savior. May that be at the top of their New Year's resolutions. I thank you, God, for these men and women. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And Dennis, here is your certificate. Lynn, would you give Dennis his certificate? Thank you.
Let's pray together once again. Father, I want to thank you on this first Sunday in the new year for this old order of worship that we follow that is hundreds and hundreds of years old that begins with praise music, worship music, and then immediately goes into confession as we realize that we're in the presence of a holy God and we are not holy. In our hearts and in our minds, we want to confess our sinfulness to you right now. And God, with the Lord's table set with the elements of communion, we confess before you our gratitude that you're the one who gives second chances them over and over and over. We pray for those who wear the uniform of our armed forces. We pray for those first responders who are on the front lines even now. And we thank you for giving us a place to worship, the freedom to worship, and people we love to worship alongside. Would you hear us as together we pray the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
And as we say the Apostles' Creed, let's remember that the first quarter of this year we'll be looking at all the biblical basis for each one of these phrases as we say what we believe with Christians all over this world. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the one holy and universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. Levi, you coming up? You and Wesley not going to come up? Okay. Here you go, darling. You're welcome. There you go, baby. There you go, sugar. All right. Hey, darling. Everybody gets a candy cane. Let me tell you something about these candy canes. Every Christmas, I do a sermon for the kids. You're welcome about candy canes, and I didn't do it this Christmas season, and somebody up in the sound booth, you know, Alina's up there in the sound booth, she said, what? You're not doing the candy cane story? So I thought I better do it for the Sunday. Where's Miss Lisa? There's some others. I'll do this for the Sunday after Christmas. So let's talk about the candy cane a little bit. We got somebody else coming in. You got Joey? Okay. So do you like candy canes? I like peppermint. I love peppermint, and Miss Renee decorates with these a lot at our house at Christmas time. And there was a candy maker a long time ago who wanted to teach kids about the real reason for Christmas. And so he gave them all a candy cane, and he said, The red reminds you of Jesus' blood, that the baby was born to die for our sins on the cross. And the white reminds us that Jesus was perfect, and when he hung on the cross, he hadn't done anything wrong like the criminals to his right and to his left. White symbolizes being completely clean. Now, something else about the candy cane is if you turn it like this, turn your candy cane like that, what letter is that? J. J. And whose name starts with J? Jesus. Jesus. So the candy cane can teach you a lot about Jesus. And one other thing if you do the candy cane back like this, it's like a shepherd's crook. And when we have the Lord's Supper and Mr. Jason raises the screen, you'll see the shepherd window up there, and Jesus is our great shepherd. So he uses the shepherd's hook to go around the sheep's neck and pull that sheep back to him. God doesn't ever want you to get too far away. All right, let me ask you a couple of questions. What letter is this? Reminds you of who? Jesus, Jesus. The red symbolizes what? And the white symbolizes that, he, that he's clean, right? That he's perfect. And one of these days he'll make us that way. We won't have any sin anymore either. All right, glad I had enough candy canes. I sure am glad to have all of you. Was Santa Claus good to you? Santa Claus good to everybody? Okay, good deal. All right, let's put our hands together and let's say, Father, I love you. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.
We'll continue our worship now through giving our tithes and our offerings. Let's pray together. Oh God, our heads are bowed by tradition, but in our hearts we know our heads are bowed because we're grateful, we're humbled that you would work through us to save the world. So please bless each gift and each giver and each recipient. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, amen. Please be seated. 
The phrase we're going to look at this morning is, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Our Old Testament lesson is Isaiah 63, verse 16. I want you to notice the verb here. But you are our Father. Not you are like a Father. You are our Father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledge us, you, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from old is your name. And then we learn what kind of Father God is when we go to the New Testament lesson. Galatians 4, we'll read verses 1 through 7. And Paul writes these words, What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He's subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. This is God's Word. May He bless it to our understanding. Let's pray together. Oh God, so often in our culture today, in our schools and colleges and universities, we're taught that it really doesn't matter what you believe or who you believe in. But God, we know differently deep in our hearts. And so thank you for bringing us to church today. That we might learn in a deeper way what it means to acknowledge, I believe in God the Father Almighty. In the name of our God, the one and only God. Amen. What is a creed? Creed is a word we don't use very much anymore. In Latin, credo means I believe. A creed then is a summary of beliefs. A Christian creed is a summary of Christian beliefs. And the Apostles' Creed, the one that we say every Sunday morning, is the oldest and most widely used confession of faith in the world. There are others, the Nicene Creed, the Scots Confession, uh, Luther has a confession, there are many of them. But the Apostles' Creed is the standard, and it's the reason that we say it every Sunday. Now, though the twelve apostles didn't actually write the Apostles' Creed, It is derived from their teachings in the New Testament. It was written around 180 A.D. And it was written by Roman Christians and used as a baptismal creed so that when new converts were baptized on Easter Sunday, before the water was placed on their heads, they were asked to say, what do you believe about God the Father? And they would say it. They were asked then, what do you believe about God the Son? They would say it. What do you believe about God the Holy Spirit? They would say it, and then and only then were they baptized and welcomed into the community of faith. It's interesting, though, that actually the creed goes back to 90 A.D., even further back, when all the books of the New Testament had been completed and these basic Christian teachings were combined into one statement. Three phrases were added later by the church. Forgiveness of sins, Holy Catholic Church, and He descended into hell. Forgiveness of sins, it's not controversial. 
Holy Catholic Church is controversial to some, so that's why the C is lowercase. It means worldwide. And then descended into hell is the one that lots of people argue about. But we're going to talk about each one of these phrases as we go through them. This three-paragraph structure of the Apostles' Creed is Trinitarian. The first part is about the Father, the second about the Son, the third about the Holy Spirit, and it's based on Jesus' command to baptize in the name of the Trinity. I like what John Calvin had to say about the Apostles' Creed. John Calvin was the father of the Presbyterian Church in the 1500s. Here's what he wrote. The Apostles' Creed comprehends a complete account of our faith and a concise and distinct order. And everything that it contains is confirmed by decisive testimonies of Scripture. And that's why as we go through each phrase, we'll be looking at the scriptural backing for all of these parts of the Creed. Now back in the day when few people were literate, and fewer people still owned a Bible, creeds were necessary. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. They didn't have a Bible if they could have read or wrote, or could have been those who were literate. And so they memorized the creed. It taught them the basics of the faith. But you might ask the question, well then, why are creeds still necessary? We're literate, we have Bibles, although I would argue very few people read this book. I hate to say that, but I know it's true. So why do we have creeds still? Well, first of all, they summarize the central teachings of the Bible. The Bible is a long book. It's not a hard book, but it is long. And the themes that run through it are what we have in the Apostles' Creed. The second reason that creeds are still necessary is that they remind us of what we believe. They remind us, they convict us, they humble us, they encourage us. And the third reason is as a witness to an unbelieving world, to so many people in Memphis, Tennessee, the United States, the world at large, who do not believe in the God of the Bible. Now they'll tell you they believe in God, but unless your faith is grounded in the Bible, The God you believe in is a God of your own imagining. He likes what you do, and He doesn't like the bad things other people do, but the bad things you do, it's all right. doesn't matter. Good to go. Most people will tell you, I believe in God. Church, eh, I don't know if I need any of that stuff. The Bible, eh, I can go to Google and find out what I need to know. What God do Christians believe in? That's the God of the Apostles' Creed. Augustine, the 4th century theologian, wrote a really interesting thing that I came across this past week. I think it's really good for today, particularly in this time when we have so many people who bow down at the altar of climate change. Green, green, that's the most important thing in life. Long ago, Augustine said, what is God? I put my question to the earth, and it replied, I am not He. I questioned the sea and the great deep and the, and the teeming creatures, and they replied, we're not God. Seek higher. To the sky I put my question. To sun, moon, and stars. But they denied me. We are not the God you seek. The stars. I was coming back with my wife Renee, my mother-in-law, uh, from Daphne, seeing our son and daughter-in-law and little grandson yesterday. And on Highway 78, right before you get to Bahalia, some of you have probably seen it. I grew up seeing it going down that highway to see my grandparents. There's this old rundown trailer and a sign outside that says, Astrologist, I will tell your future. In all these years, that astrologist hadn't got enough money to buy a new trailer. (laughs) 
And right next door is a beautiful little Baptist church. Seems like God is blessing them. Christians believe God is a father. I want to talk about that a minute. In 2008, one particular heresy of many being promoted in our former denomination pushed Highland Heights over the edge. Pastors were encouraged to begin baptizing in the name of the mother, the daughter, and the womb. And Dr. Quillen and I said, we're out. If I ever do something like that, you come up here and you hogtie me and you take me to the doctor. Something's wrong with me if I ever do that. Because Isaiah says so clearly, as so many other places, I could have picked many scriptures, but you are our Father. Though Abraham does not know us or Israel acknowledges us, you, O Lord, are our Father. Our Redeemer from of old is your name. If the Bible says God is a Father, we don't have any permission, any right to say that He is otherwise. To say that he, after thousands of years, suddenly we've discovered God is feminine. Sorry, it won't work. Or to say suddenly, well, God is the earth. Uh Uh-uh. Other religions have tried that for so long. It won't work. We don't worship the creation. We worship the Creator. Does that make sense to you? That's extremely important. So many people are confused. And the main reason they're confused is because they're not in church. They're not grounded. Paul says in Galatians, Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Abba, in Aramaic, the dialect that Jesus spoke in Hebrew, means Daddy. It's an intimate term. And some of you may not have had a very good relationship with your dad. Some of you may not even know who your dad was. But the Bible says you have a wonderful chance to have a relationship with your heavenly Father. He loves you with a love that will never let you go. And for those of us who had good relationships with our dads, We need to realize the relationship with God the Father is ramped up much, much more than we ever had with an earthly parent. The two primary functions of a father are these, to provide and to protect. God the Father provides everything you need in this life, and He provides you salvation in the next life. And God the Father protects you in this life, And He'll protect you when it comes your time to die. And He'll protect you in the next life, in heaven. God is your Father. Secondly, Christians believe God is almighty. God is infinite in His power. There is nothing our God cannot do. In His power, by simply speaking... God creates. The first two chapters of Genesis don't say that God had to get a lot of stuff together or that God took His hands, so to speak, to create the world. He simply spoke. And it was. And it was good. By simply speaking, God redeems. By simply speaking, God heals. God reveals His might, not just in raw power, but also in another profound way. Now, as far as raw power, let's go back to thinking about the climate and the universe for a moment. It isn't very logical for us to think that the, that the pollution from our cars in a country where we have done so much to clean up the air is going to change the climate. It's not realistic. It's why these people fluctuate from global warming to freezing to climate change. 
They don't know what they're talking about. It's all about power and the almighty dollar. It has nothing to do with creation, really. And we better get off that bandwagon. Of course we should take care of the earth. We're stewards. But we better get off the bandwagon of climate change and get on the bandwagon of God the Creator, God the Father Almighty. I'm kind of simple-minded, I think, uh, these apps, like the weather app, I look at it all the time. And it amazes me, I'll open up my weather app and it'll say, your location, and it will show rain coming down, which I think looks so cool on the screen. But I look outside and the sun's shining. God's in charge of the weather. God's in charge of the universe. If He's in charge of something that powerful, don't you think He's in charge of your life? Don't you think He knows what's coming and what's already happened and what you're in right now? He is Almighty. God the Father Almighty. And He reveals His might in the greatest way through the power to overcome death, through the resurrection of Jesus. So that when you simply trust Christ as your Savior, and one day your eyelids close in death, they will open in God's heaven. I found an old book of my grandfather's in my study last week. Uh, was written in the 1920s. And this old preacher named G.A. Student Kennedy, that's a pretty good preacher name, this is what he wrote about the creeds. Either you must change your creed or your creed will change you. And we need to be in the latter camp. We need to let the Apostles' Creed change us. Because, y'all, we don't have it all figured out. Only God does. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, let's not be guilty of putting our minds nor our hearts in neutral and repeating these words unknowingly as if we're robots. I believe in God the Father Almighty. We've got to stop that stuff. Sometimes we better put it in reverse and say, Whoa, what? I believe in the forgiveness of sins. There's some folks I haven't forgiven. And then put it back in drive and go forward and live your life in light of the creed changing you and changing me. It really does matter what we believe about God. It matters quite a lot. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we come to the Lord's table, we come as believers, not as know-it-alls, but as believers in your power of love to transform our lives and to transform this world. Please strengthen our beliefs in Christ's holy name, amen. Would the elders serving the sacrament please come to the table? This table is covered in, in the old southern tradition. We're going to get a new cloth. These cloths have worn out and some creative folks in my Sunday school class said, well, let's take some pieces out of it and maybe have them framed, which I thought was wonderful. The little cross there, perhaps the words here that we see on the front in remembrance of me. And this table has been set not just for the people who were on the membership rolls of Highland Heights Presbyterian Church, but for all of you who believe in Jesus Christ and acknowledge Him as your Lord and Savior. The table is set for us. So if you believe in Jesus, please don't let the plate pass you by without taking a little cup of bread. If you believe in Jesus Christ, please don't let one of these plates pass you by without taking one of the little cups of juice. 
And when you get them, hold them, reflect on your gratitude to God, and then we'll eat and drink together. Let's bow our heads. Oh God, please sanctify the elements here to that spiritual use to which you have ordained them. That we, your people, gathered at the top of this hill in this our 102nd year of worship and work may be inspired and may be nourished by grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, He took bread and He gave thanks, as has been done in His name, and He broke that bread as I, ministering in His name, have broken this bread. And He gave that bread to the disciples, telling them, This is My body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's all taste and see that the Lord is good. The Bible tells us that after the same manner, our Savior also took the cup. And after having given thanks, as has been done in His name, He gave that cup to His disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this cup to you. He told them that evening in the upper room, 
This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink of it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. What can wash away your sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Let's pray together. Oh God, throughout this Christmas season, we have feasted on turkey and dressing and ham and fudge and fruitcake and candy canes. But we know that nothing is sweeter than the taste of grace on our lips. And God, having taken communion, may we now go and be forgiving as you have forgiven us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
let's stand together and we'll join in singing Great is Thy Faithfulness. like to take home a poinsettia, please do so. There are plenty of them, plenty of extras and people who bought them who will not take them home, so please take those with you. Down where my son and daughter-in-law live in Alabama, they put them out in the yard. Wouldn't, li wouldn't live too long here in the yard, but they'd be pretty in your house. Perhaps this place feels like home to you, and home is a place where you find love, where you find you're challenged in love and where you find that you can serve. If you'd like to be a part of this church family, I sure would like to talk to you about it. May God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> 